Welcome and thank you for standing by. For the duration of today's conference, all parties will be in listen-only mode until the question and answer session of the conference. At that time, you may press star 1 on your phone to ask a question. I would like to inform all parties that today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to hand the conference over to Ms. Wendy Peebles. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, Operator. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wendy Peebles, Lead Outreach Coordinator, Census Bureau Economic Management Division. Today, Karen Reggae from the State Department, Director of Defense Trade Controls, Chief Information Officer, will continue the discussion on the tips and tricks of the deck. The Census team is happy to collaborate with the State Department to provide you this webinar. Thank you all for joining today. We have an informative webinar plan. I'd like to go over a few items before we start. The webinar today is being recorded, and for confidentiality reasons, we ask that during the question and answer period that will occur at the end of today's webinar that you do not disclose your company's name or any other sensitive information. You may submit your questions via the chat to all panelists. The chat will be monitored during the webinar. The presenter will address as many questions as possible um, during the webinar. And the contact information will be provided for further follow-up. Approximately seven to 10 business days following the webinar, the transcript recording and presentation will be hosted to the website. Lastly, we value your feedback, so please complete the evaluation form as it assists in planning future webinars. And before the State Department comes forth and with their presentation, I would just like to share a few resources um, that the Census Bureau offers. Um, the resources involve the COVID-19 Data Hub, Census Business Builder, and the Trade Source Newsletter. So quickly, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, with the pandemic, the Census Bureau developed an interactive data hub and resource page to help decision makers understand the social and economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. This um, COVID-19 interactive data hub has a dashboard that contains demographic, social economic, and business data at the state and county level to help guide your business operations. So I encourage you to visit the, visit the site. Next, we have the Census Building Builder, the Census Business Builder, excuse me. Um, the Census Business Builder is a suite of services that provides selected demographic and economic data from the Census Bureau tailored to specific types of users in a simple to access format. It provides data for business owners who need to make key decisions for business plans and better understanding of, of their markets. And lastly, the Trade Source Newsletter is published twice a year in January and July. The newsletter is a resource tool to keep businesses informed on expanding business operations globally. The newsletter will include articles on compliance, international trade statistics, and also featured articles from our partnership agencies on financial support, export licensing, and export resources and tools for business growth. So I just wanted to share with you just a few of those items. So please visit the Census website at www.census.gov. Place one of those um, headings in the search and you can find more information. So at this time, I'm gonna pass it on to Karen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. And it's so good to be here um, this afternoon. Uh, really appreciate uh, everyone coming on. Um, I know everyone's probably fatigued of, of all these uh, virtual opportunities for learning and information, but um, I do appreciate you coming on today. Um, this, is, this is just an introductory slide. I think most of you probably uh, know me by now. We've done um, these sorts of webinars every quarter since we launched and even before that in anticipation of the launch of the Defense Export Control and Compliance System, or DEX. Um, so let's go ahead to the next slide. So um, first I wanted to just kind of go through what we're, gonna, what we're gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna do a very, very brief DEX reflect, reflection, sort of the State of the Union of DEX, um, it, you know, in the next slide. And then, and then I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about a user group that we just received approval for from OMB, 
and we're going to talk a little bit about that and how that's going to work in terms of our roadmap planning for um, the external components of the of DEX. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how our development process works for enhancements and bug fixes. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to um, one of my colleagues, Chris, who's going to do a demonstration of, um, of, of DEX, um, little pieces of it that we're still getting a lot of questions on. And then we'll have plenty of time um, for questions and answers. Um, you know, so, so be thinking about what questions you have. Um, and then we'll either do that uh, through the chat or um, we'll also also have a live um, operator uh, taking um, questions from you. Uh, so, so please, um, you know, if you think of a question as we're going through this, jot it down and there'll be plenty of opportunity. About half of the time will be spent um, answering your questions. Next slide. All right. So. Um, this has been a really big year, I think, for, for all of us, um, users of DEX and also the directorate. Um, you know, we basically launched uh, right before um, COVID started um, in February. And, you know, thank goodness that we did because um, it would have been a lot more difficult to work with our legacy systems um, when everybody was uh, at home and, and still, for the, the most part, are at home doing telework. Um, so, believe it or not, we've had almost 40,000 help desk tickets. Um, this is not, um, you know, a great number because it's an enormous number and it means that a lot of people, um, you know, had questions and, and needed help um, to get uh, enrolled in DEX and also to get affiliated with their company and to sort of learn the ins and outs of how uh, DEX works. Um, so, it doesn't really surprise me. but that is a lot of calls. Um, I would say that this webinar, you know, is trending downward, which is good news. We usually, you know, we, we've had 1,000, 1,200 attendees, and I'm looking at the attendee list, and we're at 150. That might be good news because people are more comfortable and more familiar with DEX, um, and so, you know, they don't feel like they, um, they need to attend this webinar. Um, or maybe it's December. And, and, and people um, are taking use or lose. So it's hard to say, uh, but it's really all about, for me, DEX um, for industry and DEX for uh, DDPC internal, it's all about the data. Um, and that's why I sort of, you know, look at these trends, um, you know, to, to see sort of where we are. But what I can say is that I feel like we've um, together adapted to the new system. Um, although I think it's been painful for a lot of people, and I really um, have a lot of gratitude for everyone's patience in getting in and getting um, getting set up. But we've got um, 20 over a little over 23,000 um, enrollees, um, people that have enrolled in DEX um, from 16,701 unique companies. Um, so that includes our registrants, it includes uh, users that don't need to be registered, it includes uh, folks, um, non-U.S. persons that might be doing uh, retransfer, re-export applications, um, people who are wondering if, you know, their particular commodity is even under our control. So doing a commodity jurisdiction request, for example, or someone not really understanding the ITAR that might be doing um, uh, you know, a request for an advisory opinion. So all sorts of different use cases, but the, the enrollees come from 16,700 unique companies. Um, we published, pushed out um, 631 knowledge articles um, or learning guides. That's a lot of material. Um, you know, I think it's great that we have it all there, but I do recognize that's a lot of material and um, you know, sometimes it's just easier to do a service request, um, you know, but, but I would encourage you, these, these knowledge articles and learning guides are very well written and they're very well vetted and they give you a lot of information and there's ways to search for those. Um, so you may not have to do a help desk uh, ticket um, because the information um, may well be available on the website. Um, we have uh, processed um, 11,872 registrations since we launched in February, um, and the licenses that have been issued and available for 
um, for industry to pull down have been almost 19,000. So um, I would say uh, those, those numbers are tracking with what we're used to doing. Um, and, and I think that, you know, the, the demographics, I hope, of the, of the health test tickets will continue to trend down um, because it means that things are working better for people and people are, are um, you know, getting more and more familiar with it. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, so now this is, you know, we've been at this for, uh, you know, several months, um, and we have been primarily focused on bug fixes, although we have created some enhancements that have been based on um, information that we've received um, in our help desk tickets and also information that we've received from the Defense Trade Advisory Group, which has been really helpful in terms of prioritizing um, what they think we should be doing on behalf of industry. But we, we also got um, some recommendations from the Defense Trade Advisory Group about starting a DEX user group. Um, and so we are starting that DEX user group that was recommended. And the plan is, um, you know, to, to put out, and I don't know if it's gone out yet, but it's, um, it's we're, we're going to put out a web notice inviting um, industry folks to um, express their interest in being part of this user group, um, you'll have about two weeks to do that. And then um, if we, the idea is that we're going to have um, up to 50 members of this group, so it's going to be a pretty large group, but we want to have a wide variety of companies, entities, small businesses, uh, you know, different different user types, and, you know, we want to make sure that the group is, is well represented, and then we're going to launch the group in uh, January 2021. We'll have quarterly meetings um, to discuss what are the what are the what should the priorities be, and have discussions about different things that we know that the industry wants us to look at and wants us to be um, making some enhancements. But we're going to have those kinds of discussions that will be facilitated. Um, so that we can get a much better sense of actually what we ought to be doing and and how we should be um, how we should be handling um, those types of enhancements. Um, so enough about enough about that. You'll hear more about that. You should be looking on the website with respect to um, you know the timelines um, and the and it will identify exactly when the meetings will be. So that if you decide you want to uh, be part of it, you'll know whether you can swing it with your calendar. So um, go ahead, let's go ahead and, yeah. All right, so, and I, I also wanted to just very, very briefly explain how we go about our development process now that we've done the full deployment. Um, since March, we've done 16 different uh, releases. Um, the releases, as I mentioned before, they include both bug fixes and enhancements. I would say more bug fixes than enhancements um, for the external groups, although there have been some really important enhancements that we've um, put together. Um, and, and then, you know, we basically have two-week sprints. We use an agile development method, so we don't um, save up a whole bunch of requirements and, and, you know, build something over a series of months and then deploy it. What we're trying to do is uh, do biweekly releases. They don't always happen every two weeks because some things are bigger than a two-week period. But those releases are scheduled on Monday. So from 6 to 8 a.m. Are, are our planned releases, and we provide some notice about that on the website when we're about to do one. Um, so that's sort of how we that's how we go about it. So, you know, looking at the website is always important. That is the way, the primary way in which we communicate with users. Um, so, anyway, um, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Radcliffe for the demo portion of today, and then we'll have a lot of time um, for the Q&A. So, thank you. Thanks, Darren. So, I will go over a few very important aspects of DEX, um, including some de DEX tips and tricks. Regarding enrollment, part of the reason that we're, that we're going over this portion is that we're still receiving tickets where people are struggling to get connected with their company index. 
And so as a friendly reminder, we want to take people through the process again so that people know how to get properly associated with their company index. Um, this is the user enrollment page found on the login screen of the DEX industry service portal. When enrolling with DEX, always remember to fill in the information at the bottom of the page, which will associate your enrollment with an existing company. Um, this will ensure that when you navigate DEX, you'll do so as your company, corporation, or entity that you're affiliated with. If you end up having questions about enrollment or any other facet of DEX, remember to head over to the FAQ and Help Guide section. It will be here that you'll get easy access to the DEX application, our COVID response measures, news and events, and other links to helpful FAQs and information. Navigating to the FAQ webpage is pretty straightforward. Simply click on Review FAQs under the Get Help from DDTC section, and you'll be brought to the Frequently Asked Questions webpage. It'll be from here that users have a litany of categories to choose from, such as corporate administrators, advisory opinions, payment fees, and more. For the purpose of this demonstration, though, we'll focus on licensing as an example section. You'll now notice that there are a lot of FAQs for licensing, and we're continuously updating them based on our feedback and questions to the help desk and response team. So we'll choose how do I unsign a license as an example. So each FAQ is formatted like this one here, beginning with the question at hand and following with the answer. If you have any lingering questions about licensing, always feel free to click through and see what's already out there. And if you weren't able to find answers in the FAQs and help guides, or are looking for more answers on applications overall, the user guide documentation can be found within the Industry Portal's Learning Tools section. Uh, this will be an area within the portal available to all logged index users. This is also where we keep all of our user guides, videos, and other helpful information. So once you've clicked the, lear once you've clicked the Learning Tools drop-down menu, you'll have several options to choose from. Again, for this purpose of this demonstration, we'll choose the licensing section to keep it all congruent. As you can see, this is where we house all of our licensing, licensing user guides. And for your awareness, we're currently in the process of updating all of our documentation and creating individual guides for each licensing form. As these are finished, they'll be posted here and in our FAQs. Um, if you or a corporate administrator wants to learn more about access groups, click the app the Licensing Access Groups User Guide for step-by-step -step instruction. This is the same for all of the other guides that are here. They'll give you step-by-step -step instructions regarding any of the topics that are listed. And then if you have a question that hasn't been answered or by any of the available resources I previously mentioned, um, self-service will be of a great assistance. You'll want to log into, into DEX to be brought to the Industry Portal homepage. To, and to access the self-service tool, you'll click Create a Support Case within the Need Help box to start a help desk or response team inquiry. It's listed on the right side of the screen. We'd also like this time, uh, to take some time to give a few reminders about the, about the service portal and DEX. Um, we definitely recommend everyone to submit a support case for each individual issue. Um, there have been instances where users will follow up with new questions to cases which have already been resolved, and we want to make sure that all questions are answered clearly and to ensure that questions about specific issues are assigned to the correct individual to address them. So if your case has been answered already but you have another question, following up with that case via email is not the best way to get it answered. It might cause more confusion than, than providing solutions. So always remember to submit a separate case for separate issues. Also, this is a big one. In an attempt of making ticket resolution quicker, um, please do not du duplicate issues by creating additional cases addressing the exact same issue in the hopes of trying to make things move faster. Um, this will actually slow down the help desk because analysts will only be able to answer tickets in the order received, and this backs up the queue. So if it's taking a while for your case to get answered, it's not because nobody's looking at it, because there are a lot in the queue. And duplicating these cases in the hope of trying to make them go faster will slow it down. Moving on, after clicking Create a Support Case, begin filling out the form with relevant contact information, as well as information about the issue. Clicking the drop-down menu titled Subcategory, uh, 
and begin filling out the form with relevant contact information as well as the information about the issue. Once you've clicked subcategory, this will allow users to narrow down the issue to a more refined topic. As you type in the description of the issue you might be facing, it's important to note that useful information will populate in real time under the DEX help search heading. Check and see if the populated information answers any of your questions before submitting your case. Odds are that it will. Also, be sure to fill out all required information before submitting your case. Uh, there are sections here that have an asterisk preceding it, and that means that that section is required for you to answer. After you're finished, you can hit Submit. Once you've submitted your case, it'll generate a case number. On this page, you can view the status of your support case, and you can add notes to your case to chat with your help desk agent. If you'd like to reference your support cases, simply click View My Cases in the Need Help box on the right side of the portal, or you can click the Support dropdown to navigate to that page. You'll then be redirected here where you can see all of your completed and in-progress applications. Additionally, we have one last update. Um, recently, the DDTC email address has been changed, and so to contact the help desk and response team, you always want to create a support case first. But if you have the DDTC email address on file in an address book somewhere, we definitely recommend updating that email with a new address listed here at the bottom and on the Contact Us page of the DDTC website. And so now I'll pass it over to Charlie for some questions. All right. Thanks, Chris. That was excellent. Um, <clears throat> as promised, folks, we say, I always say when we have these presentations, we want to make sure we leave plenty of time to hear from you, our users. Um, and here we are with almost 40 minutes of a meeting session dedicated just to question and answer. So please, we have a smaller number of folks online today. This is an excellent opportunity. You've got the CIO of DDTC ready and available to answer questions. So this is an excellent opportunity to take advantage and get that question you've always been, oh, maybe I should ask, maybe not. This is a chance to ask it. We are here for you guys today. Um, with that in mind, I should start with the first question that we pretty much always get with these presentations is, uh, are these materials going to be available after this presentation wraps. Um, normally, just so everybody knows the procedure, um, the slides will be available on the DDTC website and the census website. I believe uh, Gina may have that link out in the chat already. If folks can't see that, let us know. Um, and also, uh, like Wendy talked about in the beginning, we will have a recording of this session um, that will be provided once it is made available to us, once it is all cleaned up and made appropriate for distribution, um, and that will be made available on both websites as well. So um, lots of links to look out for in the future there. Um, we will have more information for you uh, along with this to make sure you can get to these links as well. Okay, with that, Karen, you ready? You feeling good? I'm ready. All right. We've got a good one to start. This one's a, this one's a classic, I feel like. So the user is asking about um, accounts and how to sign up. So the question is, we have several clients that use DEX and need to link their account to ours. Are we able to link to each of our clients using one, one email address? The understanding was that I will need separate email addresses to be linked to each company. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a great question, Charlie. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, whoever asked it, um, this is a classic question. Um, and it's up to, there's, there's some debate about really how this should work. But I will tell you that you're right, that you need a separate email address for each of your clients. And I'm going to just, walk through why that decision was made and also, you know, sort of preview my thinking about how it might work differently in the future. Um, and, and it's certainly going to be, I think, a topic that we're going to talk about in that user group that I explained um, mm -hmm. earlier in this webinar. So it, you have to have separate email addresses uh, because out of an abundance of caution, I was worried about a single pane of glass for a third party to be working multiple cases from different entities. I was, I was concerned about um, the security of the data. And so I said, well, 
you know, I recognize that there are third parties that do work for multiple clients. Um, I, I completely understand that those relationships and how that works. Um, but, but I was worried that making it too easy to make a mistake was somehow uh, potentially going to um, create problems, um, you know, it, broadly in the ecosystem, but also for the government. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had a lot of time to think about this, um, and I do think that it's really cumbersome um, as a third party to, to have all these email addresses and all these separate enrollments and so on and so forth. I mean, I really, really do understand how complicated that can get if you have many, many clients. Um, and so I do want to talk about this in the user group. You know, what are ways that we can modify the system such that um, I can take care of my concerns about the single pane of glass? You know, for example, and, and I mean, this is something I've thought about, you know, for about 10 minutes, so bear with me here. But, um, you know, the idea of having a single email, enrolling once, but then having some sort of way that you have to authenticate to of your clients, right? So it's not just mm -hmm. tied to an email, it's tied to you having to, to, you know, do something extra to get into that client's records, for example. You know, that's something that I've been thinking about. And I'm sure that the user group may have other ideas about ways that we can architect this uh, so that it's both convenient and secure, because that's this whole balancing act about developing systems is, you know, you want to make it user-friendly, but you don't want to make it so user-friendly such that it is not secure enough. So that's kind of where, that's kind of what I'm thinking about, but I am punting this to the user group that's going to start in January. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, at least hopefully for the person who has asked the question, I think, Karen, that we had related the fact that this has been a topic we've been thinking of for so long that, you know, we, we like you said, we see all the sides of it. We've set security as a priority. The user group's going to be able to help guide us, you know, through those possible solutions, hopefully, to provide that, you know, more opinions and more options and opportunities for us. So I think that'd be great. All right. Perfect. Um, Along with uh, the security question, as long as we're on that topic, um, we did have one user ask a digital uh, certificate question. Um, so Lisa, I'm going to actually ask you this one. Lisa, uh, for those of you who have not joined us on these presentations before, Lisa is the lead of our communications and outreach team here at DDTC. So Lisa, the question came in, um, a user has not gotten into DEX yet, but will need to soon. Um, the question is, if you could please explain what we need to do once we purchase and install a, a digital certificate, and do we need to connect the certificate to our user ID somehow? That is a great question, and I feel like uh, almost every webinar we do, there are uh, questions about digital certificates. So I'm actually going to point everyone back to the FAQs that Chris showed us how to get through, and the only reason is because we do have some good information out there specific to digital certificates. So if you're on our website and go to the FAQs under licensing, there is a question for how do I check or verify my certificate email? That will walk you through everything you need to know about setting up your digital certificate to best work for DEX. We do ask users to go through the vendor instructions for maybe how to actually install Identrust on your workstation or the ORC wide point certificate, um, just because we do want to make sure that they are installed correctly per the vendor's instructions. But there are the steps for making sure that you are logged in correctly. Um, and as a reminder for who needs a digital certificate, it would be your empowered official or any, for who will be in charge of signing and submitting your license applications in DEX. So um, once again, it's a great chance to look around a little bit on our Learning Portal website and FAQs for empowered official and digital certificates but we do have step-by-step -step instructions for how to set it up and to tie it to your account in DEX. There you go. Look how you tied it back in, Lisa, right back into the presentation. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Karen, I 
I think I, I, this may have gone out in the advertisement, so I think somebody's interested in it. Not terribly surprising, it's usually a popular topic for us. It's the one form. And the general question is just, can you please provide more information on the one form? Specifically, what is it? What does it do? Availability, et cetera. Wow, okay, well this is a long, it is a very long project for me. And um, <laughs> we have, we, just to give some context and some history on the one form, um, it was intended to consolidate the requirements of really eight different licensing forms. The five, the six, 51, 62, 73, 74, 85, and now the new form, the 6004. Um, and then, you know, we had the notion of a notifications form, which, uh, you know, so it, it's meant to sort of consolidate all of that into a single information collection um, and to streamline the data collection because, as, as many of you know, um, you know, there's some duplication, there's some redundancy, and there's some checking between this block and that block and all this other stuff. So, so we want to kind of streamline the process. Um, and when I say the process, we want to streamline, first of all, the information collection that goes through the process of getting approved by OMB. And then we want to build to that information collection so that it's simpler to actually put the information in that you need to put in in order to get an approved license. So, so you know, that's sort of the intent of it. Um, we went out on two separate occasions um, for 60-day comments, and both times we got a lot of comments, um, and we addressed the first batch of comments and put it out for another 60-day uh, comment period. This is all under the Paperwork Reduction Act, um, which is a requirement for federal agencies to not just ask for more and more and more data, but you have to get approval to ask for whatever data you're trying to, um, trying to get from the industry or the citizenry or whoever it is you're asking it for. Um, and so then we got a second set of really good comments, and we are um, finalizing our review of those comments. Um, and then because these things have taken us a long time to both review and update the form in each instance, I talked to our OMB representative and they're recommending that we go out with another 60-day comment period. So we are hoping to finalize um, the modifications that we've made based on the comments and we'll have to do another supporting statement which really identifies exactly what we've done and how it differs from the information collections that we have approved already, which is all the individual data collections. Um, and then we'll be going out with another 60-day. That gets followed by a 30-day comment period, and hopefully the time that it takes us to, um, you know, respond to those 60-day comments will be shorter than in the previous two iterations, um, you know, and then OMB has an opportunity to, you know, look at the comments um, from the 30-day and then eventually it gets approved. Uh, um, and this process of OMB approval normally takes no less than five months from start to finish, and we are, uh, what I'm here to tell you is we're starting over again with a better product than we had the last time or the time before that, but we are starting over. Um, which I don't think is a bad thing because my own view is more public comment, the better off, um, the better we understand um, the industry's perspective, which is the one thing that um, that we don't have um, entirely. So, um, and and you know what we have, you know the idea here is that uh, once that form gets approved, um, we're going to be modifying the rules to point to that form um, and we'll be building out the interactive application index um, and then we'll deploy it. And so all of those things sort of have to meet together. So the first step is to get the OMB approval and then the next step is to have the rules point to that new collection and the system itself be built and tested um, by industry, which, which I recognize will take time, um, especially for those industry uh, folks who use um, the, you know, that are sending us 
uh, batch filings. Um, and so it's one thing for a smaller company that is doing it interactively, um, you know, to get used to it. Um, it's another thing when we have to, um, you know, fundamentally change the way that um, our batch filers conduct business. We recognize that that's going to take um, more time. So um, that's kind of where we are right now. So it won't be um, it won't be released um, until 2021. Um, I don't know the exact timing, but um, we are nearly complete with our review, um, and we are finalizing the form, but then we have to write the supporting statement. So I'm hoping um, first quarter, first uh, calendar year quarter of 2021, it will be going back out again. All right. For something this significant, though, uh, for those folks who, or for the person who asked the question and for other folks who may be wondering, uh, I think, Karen, the, the stress here is that this is a big shift. I think, like you said, this isn't just an individual web page we're changing. This is a fundamental shift in how we're collecting this data. So the timeline does make sense. Like, we want to make sure that we're getting this right and that we're covering all of our bases. So for anybody who's excited and interested in this one form coming out, know that we are working on it, but we're making sure that we're being thorough and getting all the feedback we can to make the system work as effectively as, a, as we can. Is that a fair statement, Karen? Yes, Charlie, I think that's a good point. And for anybody who's interested in development development timelines, um, you know, I think that what we're looking at is um, while while this is out on public comment, we'll be developing um, the documentation for the batch filing. Um, and we won't release that until the form is approved. So, I mean, let's just take an illustrative timeline, like, I mean, let's just say, and I'm not saying that this is what's going to happen, but let's just say that we were able to release this in January. Um, you know, when we release it, we'll start doing the documentation, um, and we'll update the documentation when the 60-day comment period ends with whatever changes we're going to make, and then we'll update again after the 30-day comment period. And we're going to be in a position that within 30 days um, of approval, we'll get all the approvals to push that out. Um, that right. will tell you that we, are, that we are starting to build, right? Because if we pushed out the documentation to you, then we're ready to build, and that would be your time to build. Um, so in terms of coming up with budgetary line items and that sort of thing, I would say that we're, we, we will start to build in 2021. Um, you know, that's my goal. That's my, that's my aspiration. That's, my, that's what I'm hoping. Um, <laughs> and you will know, though, when we publish uh, those, you know, those, those, um, those requirements. That final requirement, um, yep. Notice. Nice. All right. So keep an eye out that, for that, folks, and then you will have your the benchmark as to where we are in the process. That's a perfect a perfect check. Thank you, Karen. All right. I'm going to shift back over, Lisa. Based on the last question about licensing, I'm going to go back to you because somebody asked um, the side a related question of, do you need to be an empowered official to submit a registration? That is a great question. So, no. Um, you need to be a senior officer to submit a registration. The empowered official is a term that is defined in the ITAR in Section 120.25, um, that this is the person who must be the empowered official and have the digital certificate to submit a license. And another key thing to remember here, and it is available in some of our recorded webinars, um, for something to go over and sort of the how do you submit a license as an empowered official, make sure that your corporate administrator has given you the role in user management of empowered official. So it's sort of two pieces. You need to meet the, uh, meet the ITAR definition of an empowered official, have that digital certificate, as well as the role in the DEX system. But um, to answer your question, it's not for registration, but for licensing. 
then related question, Lisa, same thing. Does a commodity jurisdiction submission need to be submitted by an empowered official? To my knowledge, it's, it's just licensing. Just licensing, yep. yeah. I can, I, I can confirm that um, it is only licensing that an empowered official needs to sign. Yep, because commodity jurisdictions and advisory opinions can all be submitted without even being registered. So you don't need to be an empowered official, it's just licensing, yep. All right, Karen, uh, related, I think, a little bit to the one-form conversation, the general question came in here about general correspondence. So the question is, will general correspondence move to DEC submission in the foreseeable future? Uh, that's a good question, and there's lots of variety of general correspondence. So um, some general correspondence is already indexed um, through the DS6004 form that was originally for re-export and re-transfer applications. But since COVID, we have expanded its use. And I don't know all the real parts. Charlie, you may know all the real parts. I don't know all the real parts. But it was mm, in yeah. notice where we actually expanded it. And we went to OMB under the Paperwork Reduction Act and asked for this expansion. And we asked for it um, on, in an exigent circumstance sort of way because of COVID. We got approval. And, you know, we're extending, we're trying to extend that authority so that more people can do those um, actions electronically through DEX. Um, there may be some other requirements, notifications, you know, a bunch of other, like, little things that you're accustomed to doing um, with general correspondence. Um, and literally everything that we can automate and make part of DEX, we intend to do so. Um, so that's sort of the general view about general correspondence. I do not like general correspondence. I recognize that there are some things that you can't put in columns and rows, but in general, I don't like general correspondence. It's easy to get lost. It's easy for these things to, to you know, not get responded to. So if it has to do with licensing, um, it, you know, it behooves all of us to make it sort of electronic and, and have it be an electronic form and an electronic process or a digital process. Um, so, so that's sort of the way that I look at it. I, I, don't, know, whoops, I don't know what um, percentage um, of, of general correspondence we've covered already and what we're going to cover later, um, but suffice to say, everything that we can, we will put into DEX. Yep. If nothing else, it is a goal of the system, right? That is. That is what DEX is intended to do, is to keep these as standard and as trackable, auditable as possible. So, yes. <clears throat> Absolutely, Charlie. That's exactly yeah. the way. Um, that's exactly it. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Um, just a quick one, Lisa, which is always a fun one. Again, as we are talking about this outreach thing, I think Chris mentioned this, um, working on the updating the licensing application user guides. Um, is there a date in mind when those will be completed? And is there any chance the licensing guide is getting prioritized? Um, <clears throat> and will that also include updating the agreement guideline? That's a great question. So as Chris mentioned, we are breaking out and creating individual user guides for each of the license applications. Keep in mind that this is more for the DEX system, so it's how to get through it and less about what to fill in, because that is more of the licensing office's side. But um, they are all in draft and currently in review. Um, not to give myself too harsh of a deadline, but you know that is something that should come up very early in the new year. All of the new licensing guides posted. <laughs> we always know that licensing is always a popular topic, and especially with the variety of forms and things we are trying to put out, um, as much information on each individual form as well to give people as much help as we can with the with the system side of it, right? Um, but yeah, don't don't give us that assignment too much. Come on, we got we got lots of docs, Lisa, lots to do. All right, um, Karen, another one on uh, something that might fall on the DDTC priority list, um, specifically the digitization of the voluntary disclosure form and submission via DEX. Is that coming up sometime in the future? 
Yes, we are. Again, this is you know this is a high priority because there's a lot of them, right? It's not um, it's not something that just happens from time to time. It happens quite a lot, and so um, we are uh, currently. I mean, that form um, was approved, and then we actually made some changes to it. I think that was approved. Uh, I, know, I know, I mean, we have an approved form that we are working on uh, voluntary disclosures. Now, I will point out that, you know, after COVID, we had made, um, allowed people to electronically, um, uh, you know, submit disclosures via email. Um, and so that's kind of a new process. And so, um, you know, there's, you know, I'm interested to find out from industry, you know, how high a priority um, the voluntary disclosure submission, the digital um, piece of the submission is for people. Um, we do have, uh, we're currently uh, in development on that and just are trying to figure out where in the roadmap that should get deployed because, you know, we, we do recognize that there's, been a, long, a large learning curve to use DEX, and we want to make sure that people are comfortable with our uh, deploying voluntary disclosures. Um, and I think that's another topic that we'll um, discuss, and that's a question that I'll ask um, during the, um, the DEX user group, like what the prioritization of that form is. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question for them. And then I think, and I'm hoping, or at least my hope, Karen, is that, you know, like we said, people are still getting used to DEX. Like you said, you're talking about the learning curve. The hope is as people are renewing, um, we should be coming up on uh, a year of DEX coming in the February of next year. So hopefully we are going to have most folks who are going to be exposed to DEX are going to have that first introduction at least by February. So hopefully that learning curve will, you know, more and more people are going to be further along that curve very soon. Um, so hopefully some more of these more advanced functionalities can be can be put out there and people can take advantage of them as they get more comfortable um, with the base system. Yeah, and I would I would totally agree with that. Um, but you know a lot of the folks who a lot of the the companies that that do licensing um, should already be pretty well acclimated to the system. Um, and so it's just I don't want to overload um, and bring too much on too quickly if it's not going to serve everybody's interest. And so yeah. that's why I would ask the question. Um, you know, right. when, you know, and the other thing that we want to do is we want to allow companies to not just put in data enter in their disclosures, but actually submit those disclosures if they want to um, in a batch, so without data mm -hmm. entry from, from system to system. So, you know, we, we want to also incorporate that functionality in that release. Yeah, that would be great. All right. Thank you. All right. Speaking of potential future work, Karen, and this may be another question for um, the user group, um, but somebody out there asked if there is any chance now that we're submitting DSP 85s via DEX, is there any talk about an amendment to a DSP 85? I guess the concern is that uh, minor change in the form now still requires a brand new license replacing the existing one. So is there any thoughts on potentially a DSP 86? Yeah, I'm actually trying to reduce the number of forms, um, but I think it's a really good point. Um, and I never really, I never really completely understood the new form number when there's an amendment, a small amendment to, you know, a form that you filled out. And so I'm just, I'm wondering if in the interim, um, you know, we couldn't go to OMB and, and um, you know, it's basically changing the purpose, right? It's either a new or it's an amendment, and then whatever you're allowed to amend, you'd be able to amend. So I haven't actually heard this um, before, but but I, I'm glad the question came up because I've always been a little bit, you know, a little perplexed by, you know, the fact that it's a whole other form um, as a business process in 2020. Um, and I made a commitment to not make changes in the initial deployment of DEX to the licensing forms because I really felt it was too much change. Um, I'm a little bit, 
I, I'm a little regretful of my reluctance to do the to to be worried about too much change because since COVID, um, most of the folks inside and the external users seem like they want more and more change. Like the you know we have such a huge um, backlog of requests because you know people have really embraced Dex in a way that I was not expecting, uh, but I also wasn't expecting COVID. So and I think just across the the globe. Um, you know, companies are noticing that their users are, you know, have accelerated in their adoption of new technology. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is something that, you know, I think um, because we are standing up the user group, we can talk about in terms of what is the prioritization of that. Um, that could take a little bit of time because we do have to go back to, um, to OMB on it. They would certainly... Um, think it was a good idea because it would reduce burden because to have to do it all over again makes no sense really, um, yeah. but but it would take time for us um, to to deploy such a change. Yeah. So more to come on that, but it, it is it is part of maybe even a deeper philosophical conversation about what is the right way to collect that type of change of information to that level. Yeah, and I mean that's yeah. that's really what the one form is all about, right? Yeah. Is that mm -hmm. it 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 doesn't matter if it's a if it's a permanent export or a temporary import or a temporary export, uh classified, unclassified, new amendment, it doesn't matter. It's all the same stuff. So why why force people to continue to duplicate the data over and over and over again, depending on what they're doing? Um yeah. And so, you know, that's really the philosophical shift with the one form is to just whatever it is you want to do, there's, you know, a purpose and there's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a new or it's an amend or it's a cancel or it's a, you know, it's, it's one of those things. And it's, it's a temporary import, it's a temporary export, it's a permanent export, it's, you know, so it's, it's just those few questions at the beginning. And then it's really like all the other information is largely the same mm -hmm. in these forms. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want, we don't want more hoops than we need. That's, exactly. Yeah. Speak, okay. Well, speaking of making the process easier, I guess, um, there's another question on here, Karen, um, about future plans. Um, specifically, is there a plan to provide API management and industry access to DEX in the future? Absolutely. Yes, that is our plan. That is our priority. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd like to do it sooner rather than later, but I do want to hear people's feedback on how important is that um, to users. Uh, and so, yeah, that's the plan because, you know, that's going to be um, – and, and also, I mean, along with that, and I'll just bring this up, along with that is a discussion about whether or not there's a better way – it, whether there's a more modern way than the digital cert for authentication mm -hmm. and for identity identity management and identity proofing, mm -hmm. so so those are topics that that I want to have conversations about and get a sense of what some of the concerns are, or you know who's championing what champion who's who's a champion of what technology mm -hmm. um, and why. You know, but just sort of as an ecosystem, have these kinds of conversations so that we can, um, you know, not build something, make make a, a seemingly right decision that turns out that we need to change it in a year because it's not the best solution. Right. Take the time up front. Plan the path exactly. correctly. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Sounds like we have maybe somebody we would highly encourage to volunteer for the user group if they are so interested and want to be part of that conversation that would be yeah. that would be a good place to do that um speaking of which karen then somebody's asking if i do volunteer for the dex user group what is the time commitment actually like am i expecting another meeting on my calendar every week yeah no no <laughs> <laughs> we all have to. I don't, I don't need another, I don't need another, you know, another <laughs> uh, appointment in um, my schedule every week. So I mean, the idea is um, that, that we want to facilitate these conversations. Um, we want to provide you with notice about what we're going to be talking about. 
um, and and we want to do this in quarterly sessions. Um, and then, you know, there may be opportunities um, between those quarterly sessions for people to get together to maybe report out on a particular type of technology or a particular um, pain point that industry is having to make some recommendations to us. But it is it is not meant to be a time suck. Um, it's it's meant to to really get some um, some information from people um, where you can do some thinking and then you can be part of this facilitated conversation. Um, and then you know if there's follow up questions, you know, and you want to be part of some interim group to have another maybe discussion in between the quarter. So at most we're talking about um, maybe a, a two hour quarterly meeting and then you know, maybe an hour um, or two between those quarterly meetings if you decide that you want to be part of, um, you know, a group that's doing some follow-up work. Right. So hopefully not overwhelming, but definitely all appreciated and valued for the time that can be provided. So, yeah, we'll yeah. keep it sane. <laughs> all right, Lisa, I think one more for you here, um, specifically focused on DEX enrollment. So does DEX recognize a company registering code from a company whose registration has lapsed? That's a great question. And the answer is that, so um, what you saw when Chris demoed the enrollment form, that to be tied to your company, you could enter your company name and registration code. But um, it is important to note that that needs to be an active registration. It will not recognize expired or lapsed registrations. Okay, there we go. All right, then as we're getting close to the end time here, Karen, I think I'm gonna ask one uh, that I have seen come up in other situations. Um, I think this is applicable still back to the user group now. Um, so specifically, if I join the user group, uh, are they re is the user group really gonna have any impact? I'm very used to asking for updates, only be told, to be told there's a technical reason that my suggestion can't be done. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, it's going to be, it's, I think it's going to be really, um, uh, very valuable. Um, I think we've already, um, made changes that have been, um, better than what we deployed. Um, I am very interested in what industry has to say about the system because you're the primary users. And so, um, you know, I, Will everyone be happy? Probably not, because um, I, you know you can't make everybody happy. But the idea is that we really want people's feedback, um, and and you know I worked um, in the government before, and then I went and I worked in the industry that we were regulating. So it was in the telecommunications industry. I worked at the FCC, and then I worked as a consultant to the telecommunications industry. And I and I remember saying, God, if I had only known when I was working at the FCC, like what you guys, what tel what telecom companies went through, like I would have done things differently. And I I said to myself, if I ever go back, I'm not going to make that same same mistake twice. Um, and so, you know, I, it's it's really important to me that we uh, that we listen to the industry and that we do what we can where it makes sense to make the process as painless as possible. Still making it secure, still making it, um, you know, getting the information that we need to do our work. But, um, but certainly where there can be efficiency gains, we wanna make them. There we go. All right, I think that was a good one to end on. Thank you, Karen. Lisa, final reminder for the group. Sure. So just wanted to let everyone know, um, thank you for your questions. We actually got through, I'd say, over 90%. If we did not get to your question, please enter, um, follow the steps for the entering it on the self-service, and we will have the appropriate help desk or response team agent help wrap that up for you. So we'll turn it back over to uh, Wendy to close this out. Okay, great. Thank you all. Once again, thank you for your participation in today's webinar. and. Special thanks to the team from the State Department, Karen, Chris, Charlie, and Lisa. Great job. Um, provided a thorough overview and 
demo of the DEX system and just created a, a welcoming um, platform um, for your questions to be asked. So we certainly kind of structured it a little different today where we did allow more time for your questions, which was needed. So um, a lot of good questions with thorough responses. So once again, um, please visit the State Department um, website for the materials, the presentation, transcript, and recording, or the Census Academy, um, the link that was provided via the chat. So if there are no additional questions, this completes the webinar for today. Thank you for joining, and please be safe.